advise you guys. Most of them are all set up for you. Okay, great. Ian's a dear friend. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a good guy. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, some of the can I see my slides here? And he's like, oh, that's not that stuff. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, looking back like this every time, that's kind of sucks. All right. And here's your microphone. Go ahead. That's off. Okay, that should be off. Yeah, that's off. Okay, all right. Uh, you want to introduce us? Just have been on or whatever. Yeah, no problem. Oh, sorry. All right, good afternoon, Jersey CTF. How is it going? Good? Bad? Okay? Okay? Yeah, good, yeah. All righty. So second in our series of speakers for the day, I'm going to be introducing C.S. Carranza and S.O.S. Drzdowski from the FBI to give a presentation this afternoon. Please give them a warm round of applause. All right, thank you so much. I move around, so I can't sit still. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? You guys okay? All right. Uh, there you go, PowerPoint. Awesome. So as, uh, as I said, my name is computer scientist Alberto Carranza. I, am work, I work for the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, out of the Newark field office especially right here, which uh, is actually, I, I believe it's only the office is what, half a mile yeah. from here? So if you guys were not aware, the FBI does have an office here in Newark. As a computer scientist, I've been working with the FBI for 13 years. And out of those 13 years, 11 of those have been with the Cyber Task Force. So what does the Cyber Task Force do? We investigate all kinds of computer crimes the traditional computer intrusions, but as well, national security cases. Uh, out of those, all that work that we do, it takes approximately, right now on our task force, there's about 30 people, and we do that for the area or area of responsibility, which is new work. However, because cyber crimes tends to be not only throughout the states, but also internationally, we tend to investigate cases that happens all across the world. Uh, before the FBI, I worked in the private sector. I worked at Spencer's Gifts. I'm not sure if you guys hang out at the malls anymore, but at the malls, there were some Spencer stores. So I used to work there. I was a network administrator. And before that, I worked at Caesars Casino Hotel in Atlantic City. I'm not sure if any guys like to gamble yet, but uh, I worked there in the data center, and while I was working at Caesars Casino, I was also going to college. So I went to college to uh, Stockton University, and I got my bachelor's degree fr uh, from uh, Stockton as a computer science major. And before that, I uh, was uh, in the military for four years, and I served with the United States uh, Marine Corps. Mike? Hey everybody, my name is SOS Mike Drzdowski. I work also with Alberto on the Cyber Task Force out of FBI Newark. Um, I've been in the FBI for just over four years now. I started as an intern. Uh, I was interning while I was actually here. I went here for my undergrad. Um, I was an IT major at NJIT for my undergrad. Graduated in 2021. And I'm actually a current grad student here at NJIT, uh, just a virtual student. So first time back on campus in a while. but. Regardless, I have been with the FBI for four years. I work primarily cyber investigations, and as an SOS, I do a lot of data manipulation, data analysis, um, not only for the agents, but also other analysts. Okay. So we're gonna have a, a video. I hope uh, that the sound works. Okay.
I can hear you. All right, so while they're getting uh, the sound fix, uh, we just kind of want to give you an overview what the cyber program means in the FBI. So can someone tell me what do you guys think we do, really? Just take a guess. In the cyber, when it comes to cyber realm, what do you guys think we do? Come on. Forensics, that's one thing. What else? How to stop the Russian Chinese from hacking us. Oh, boy. Boy, we, we can try. We can try. Uh, but we do have a lot, a lot of that visibility. Yes. What else you guys think we do? Was that threat hunting? Sure do. What else? Put your names on the list somewhere. Yeah, sure, why not? I mean, not for nothing, but uh, if, you hear, if you hear cyber news every day, you hear breaches, right? Our names, whether we like it or not, they're out there. So I know me as a T-Mobile customer, my name is out there. at and I mean, all these big companies, their breaches, all of a sudden, all of our names are out there now. So not just with the government, but out there in the dark forums. And, and anybody else? What else do you guys think we do? Digital investigations, of course. That means going online, maybe going into those dark forums, yes. Anybody else, take a guess. Hardening, yes. We do that more because in our investigations, we do that more of telling the victim, say you were you, you had a computer intrusion, you had an incident. He here's how they got in. So please do patches for hardening. Any other guess? Who who are coders here? Who codes? Who enjoys coding? Yes? We do that here too as well. We have to write code, a lot of code, just because there are new tools every day that to be able to just able to read the data, we have to sometimes just write code for it. So if you love coding, we do that as well. How about malware reversing engineering? Who has, that, that, who has done that here? Who has looked at a, a malware and ripped it apart? You have? Not successfully? Oh, it's very hard. It's not easy. But if you enjoy coding, you can also be good at reversing malware. How are we doing with the sound? All right. All right, we're just going to play it for uh These are people We're just going to skip it. We're just going to skip the the video. Cuz he hears. Okay. All right, so just just in the video, what the video showed was that the FBI wants people like yourself here in this room. That's what the FBI wants. We need those technical savvy people that understands how technology works nowadays. And as you guys are aware, technology moves at such a fast pace that we need people that can understand it and adapt. So that's what they pretty much the video show that no longer the FBI is looking just, you know, as you guys see in, in the in TV and movies, 
that the agents are just kicking door. No, a lot of, a lot of the time that agents take is behind the keyboard just trying to figure out technology. Because whether it's a cyber case or a counterterrorism case or counterintelligence, guess what? Technology uh, takes place in all those cases. So agents nowadays need to be technical savvy, and that's what we need. The FBI needs people like yourself here. And to show you, we have three priorities that the FBI has. We have actually more than, 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 than 10. I mean, we have top 10, but here's three. And just to show you that terrorism, espionage, and cyber are in the top three. And cyber is a huge priority for the FBI because it, like I said, it touches all these other violations as well. Next. So the FBI, like I said, I work here in the, in the cyber office. I'm a computer scientist. I am not an agent. So I don't carry a gun. I'm just a technical nerd, just like you guys here, that works for law enforcement. But we do have, on those task forces, we do have agents that do have the gun, uh, but they are technical savvy as well. Um, but also we have other people that help us, like Mike here, who help us with the intelligence. As you guys imagine, we have a lot, a lot of data. So we need the, someone to go through the data for the intelligence. So Mike, you wanna talk about it? Sure thing. So uh, a lot of the time, like the word intelligence could be a very broad uh, term here. Uh, a lot of my role deals with like tactical level intelligence where I have to look at things, whether it be like uh, phone dumps or server dumps or any sort of evidence that we get back from searches and try and draw connections and find different pathways uh, that these actors are going to take. So in terms of like with with like cyber crimes specifically a lot of people use monikers right you have your discord monikers whatever it is in order to draw those connections to a real life person because we can't serve a search warrant on a discord monitor that that, that just doesn't work right so you have to identify who the individual is that is committing the crimes and make sure you can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that that person is this moniker right and then from there you can establish uh, legal process such as search warrants indictments whatever from there my job is trying to draw those connections and help the agents as well as the intelligence analysts through the work of uh, computer scientists and the agents as well and that's something that happens on the cases here uh, for example in Newark but also as the FBI uh, we actually like I said we have to work internationally So our capabilities, as it comes to cyber, the FBI also works with other law enforcement agencies in the United States. And the NCIJTF, which is the National Cyber Joint Investigative Task Force, is one of them. Uh, we also have what is called the Cyber Action Team. So if there was something, a breach, and like that's uh, when you think of, oh, maybe a power plant or something uh, something that is very critical that was hacked then that's where we deploy these teams to do the incidents response because this is very uh, critical to our infrastructure and also uh, we also have laboratories to do digital forensics so I don't know anybody here is interested on digital forensics great I do that a lot on, on my cases right because a lot of the evidence uh, that we collect that we process we have to be able to treat it as evidence to be admissible in court. So we, we have laboratories like CART. We have one here in New Jersey. It's actually, it's called the New Jersey Regional Forensic Lab. Uh, but we also have other per personnel throughout uh, the state of New Jersey. Myself, I'm certified as part of uh, a CART technician. So uh, again, we have to be able to collect evidence that is gonna be admissible in court. And next. So I just wanted to show you a little map of New Jersey. What is our area responsibilities? Uh, our main office here in New Jersey is in Newark. That's 
that's our main center office, but we also have satellite office throughout the state. So we also have offices, for example, in Atlantic City. We also have offices in Trenton. Uh, my office, or where we work at, is sitting out of uh, Branchburg, New Jersey. It's, uh, it's considered the Franklin Township uh, office. So we are, uh, we have small offices all over the state. Um, funny thing is, though, but uh, Camden County, it actually falls under the uh, Philadelphia division. Uh, but Philadelphia has their own office themselves. Next. And just to give you a little bit of overview of the type of cyber crimes and the, and the threats that we um, have to investigate. So when you think of hacktivism, what do you guys think of hacktivism? Anonymous, right? And how long has that anonymous been active? Right, but at first, as a hacktivist, what do you think is their goal at first, right? Some, yeah, a lot of the time it's political, right? And sometimes it goes and blurred the lines. But yes, Anonymous has, is one of our, the most uh, famous, I think you would say, of uh, the hacktivists. Um, cybercrime, or typical cybercrime, we can think of uh, ransomware, right? Everybody is aware of ransomware? And pretty much is their goal is to make money, right? That's their motivations. How about insider threats? Has anybody thought of that as a cyber crime? What do you guys think is an insider threat? Within the company, right? So let's say one of the students here from NJIT, and let's say one of the students that work in the IT department, and he decides to just start unplugging the servers, right? What do you think happens to the NJIT infrastructure, right? That's an insider threat. That is somebody that already has access and can easily shut down the network. That's what is considered an insider threat. How about espionage? What do you guys think of espionage? Correct. 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 That's absolutely. He, uh, the gentleman said that it's usually when you think of espionage is when somebody is inside and stealing secrets that uh, it could be shared with other nations, um, especially if those secrets are very sensitive and they can be used uh, for military purposes. Uh, another thing could be insider threat. Think of it of here in the United States, right? The United States, we do a lot of research. And I'm sure NJIT do a lot of research, whether it's engineering, or if you think about the pharmaceutical companies that are here in New Jersey, we have pharmaceutical companies like Johnson & Johnson, for example, Merck, right? If you think of it, these companies, they're the ones who did the research for COVID vaccines. So they spend a millions of dollars on research for medications, and the espionage is get people inside to steal that research and take it to other nations, because it's just cheaper to steal it than to actually spend the time and money on research. And then terrorism and warfare as you, is kind of self-explanatory. You guys are aware of what's happening. Uh, one good example, uh, you can see that as cyber uh, terrorism and warfare is actually what's happening between Russia and Ukraine, right? There's actually a physical war, but it's also there's a cyber war as well in that, in that environment.
it's light. It's quite warm actually. Sorry guys, we have some uh, technical difficulties here with the All right, all right. You want to you want to say something? Yeah. Okay. So next slide, please. All right. So these are w a couple of things, and that I mentioned earlier. What does a computer scientist do? about not only I do the forensics, but also I have to wear many different hats. So when we're technical here, when it comes to computer science, that is a very broad degree, correct? Because we can go, we can do many different things. I know when I got, I went and studied for computer science, you had that question like, well, what do I want to do in computer science? Do I want to do network administration? Do I want to do coding? Do I want to do just programming as well? Well, because you do have that broad education, you can actually do all of this. And not for nothing, but I have to do all of this for the cases. Because when it comes to cyber cases, one day I may have some evidence that sits on a cell phone, or I may have to get some evidence from a database. So I have to be very flexible to know how to deal with all those different technologies. Keep it going. Keep going. And we're going to talk about a little bit of what I do as obtaining evidence. So digital forensics, that means laptops, desktop computers, cell phones, uh, servers, whether they're in here or servers there are in the cloud. So all of these types are considered digital evidence and as my part of my job, I have to know how to obtain that evidence and how to preserve it and what equipment or what ways to do uh, to be able to get that into evidence and preserve it for court. Next slide. And here's an example of a little bit of what kind of equipment that we use uh, to create digital evidence. Uh, it could be simple as just doing what is called a copy or a forensic image and just saving it into some kind of hard drive. Or if you're working on an enterprise level, whether you're working for the FBI or you're working, for example, Amazon, right? If they have an incident, and I'm sure they have multiple incidents, they probably have some kind of enterprise network to maintain and host all that evidence. So all of this, we have to know how to do that. If you guys get a chance, I have a, there's a table set up in the back. There are some um, forensic imaging equipment back there. Just go ahead and take a look if you wanna see what, what, kind, of, what kind of this equipment looks like. Um, next. Uh, cell phones, right? Everybody believes, not, not for nothing, but nowadays, a majority of evidence is sitting right here in your pockets, right? Because everybody lives with their cell phones, and as you can imagine, you know, not only emails, pictures, chats, I mean, probably everyone here has probably about 100 apps installed on their cell phones. So there is a lot of data that it sits there. So we obviously would like to, when it comes to uh, an investigation, that's the first thing we kind of look like, okay, Let's see if they have a cell phone that we can use. Obviously, we have to have a search warrant from a, from a judge. So it's not like I can just go ahead and just grab your cell phone whether I want to or not, right? You have to have a legal authority to do that. And I'm going to give out uh, two cases that were investigated here uh, out of the Newark field office. Uh, this first case, uh, it involved a Rutgers student. I'm not sure if anybody heard about Paraz Ja. Has anybody heard about him? Anybody? I mean, this incident happened almost, it's almost 10 years now, but he was a Rucker student that 
uh, we investigated uh, for DDoS. Anybody knows what the DDoS is? Can anybody tell me what's DDoS? Distributed denial of service. Yes. In this case, was investigated here out of, out of Newark. And then we have another second case that is uh, more recent and it's involved, it's a ransomware case. So back in 2014, 2016, denial of service attacks, distributed denial of service attacks was being conducted against Rutgers. And Rutgers computer networks were just crashing. Can you guys imagine what kind of networks were crashing? Take a guess. What kind of, what kind of networks do you guys use here as students? What's that? Wireless networks? Okay. What other, uh, what other networks? How about when you uh, register for, for a class? Right? Any other, any other networks? Okay. Access control? Any other networks that you guys use here in school? Canvas, okay, right? So there are multiple networks that NGIT uses, right? So same as Rutgers. So guess what? These networks were going down, and while this happening, the attacker was bragging about it on Twitter. Go ahead, next slide. And he was on Twitter, and he was bragging about it uh, his, sign, uh, his Twitter handle was xfocus, so we, that's what we call the case, xfocus. So he was doing that, as, uh, as you can see on Twitter, he was doing it multiple times. So he was crashing, when students wanted to sign up for classes, he was crashing that. He was crashing the network when some students want to take midterms, he was crashing those networks as well. And guess what Rutgers was doing? to try to fix that issue. Take a guess. If all the networks are going down, what, what, what do you got to do? Correct. Anything else? Huh? Turn it off and on again? Yes. But not only that, but now they have to spend money, a lot of money, because now their servers are going down. And guess what? The students need these networks. So they're going to be spending a lot of money to protect themselves, but also buying equipment to be able to withstand the attacks, correct? So Rutgers is spending millions of dollars also getting incident responders to figure out how to defend for the attacks. Next slide. So DDoSing, what do you guys think anybody can learn those skills? Where do you learn how to DDoS? How do you learn to do, conduct that, that kind of attack? Huh? Google? Okay. Where else? Dark, if, if you join some dark forums, sure. Reddit. Reddit's a good spot to, to learn. IRC, wow, going back, going old school. IRC, yes. That's where people. Right. GitHub, yeah, sure, there's a lot of codes in GitHub, right? Where else? I mean, there's one that is very. YouTube, right? There's a lot of tutorials on YouTube. But let me tell you, this individual learned how to DDoS by playing Minecraft. You guys believe that? Who plays who plays Minecraft here? Who, who has played Minecraft? All of us? Where do you guys play it? Console or online? PC, all right? Who's the PC gamers here? All of us, right? Okay. Who who has a Minecraft server? Oh, you got one here. Oh, oh used to. Okay, how long ago? Ten years ago. Okay. Anybody else has a Minecraft server? No. Okay. Let me ask you. Why did you Why did you want to stand up a Minecraft server? He want to make money. 
his motivation to stand up a Minecraft server was to make money, right? Because a lot of other kids or other people come and play on your server and you can make money. <laughs> Correct, it's just gaming. Same, same reason. Arasja, this individual, stood up Minecraft servers at the age of 12, 13, just because he wanted to play Minecraft online and he wanted to make money. Next slide. So once you start realizing, oh, I'm standing up these Minecraft servers, did you have any problem with your servers going down because you were getting a lot of people coming in? There was a limit, right? So he learned that too. He learned that, oh, my server is getting overloaded with people coming in to my Minecraft server. I need to learn how to keep my servers up. So he taught himself how to do that. But guess what? By learning how to defend his server, he also learned how to attack other servers. Because he figured, oh, I'm making a lot of money. And he was. He was making like $8,500 a week just from, from people he has, more gamers and more gamers. But he said, what if I attack my competition? Why, what if I attack other Minecraft servers, take them down, and all those customers, they're going to come to me, and I'm going to make more money. So that's what he did. And he was doing that. He wrote his own code, right? He learned his own code to how to conduct those attacks, and he utilized the Internet of Things devices. What do you guys think is that? IOTs. What's IOTs? Smart thermostat, what else? Anybody else? Any IoT example? What's that? Lights, the smart lights. Anything else? IoTs? What's that? Roombas, yep. Think of, think of your DVR. What about your webcam? Like, a lot of people have ring cameras, right? At home. That's an IoT device, right? Because it's always connected to the internet. So Paraz Ja was able to write code and said, you know what, I'm going to utilize all these devices that are out there that are connected to the internet, and I'm going to use them and create a botnet to conduct these attacks. And he did. And when he started to do that, he named his code, he called it Mirai, and he started to attack the competition. And when he was doing the attacks, there were about uh, 145,000 devices, and the majority of these devices were in Anchorage. So Anchorage, the FBI office in Alaska, they opened a case because they saw the DDoS attacks happening. So now we have two cases, one case out of FBI Newark, and now we have another case of FBI Anchorage. Next slide. And just to show you, this is how many devices worldwide that he had infected with his botnet to conduct the attacks. Next slide. So FBI Anchorage started to do investigations, and they created some honeypots, meaning that they put IoT devices out on the internet to get self-infected so they can start seeing how the botnet worked. And when they do that, they start to finding, oh, this infected device is calling out to a command and control server, and we find that IP address. We serve legal process, and then we go through that rabbit hole to find the owner of that infrastructure, which that's when Paraz Ja was identified. Next. Right before we, we were going to go to his house, Paraz Ja with other co-conspirators realized, I'm going to get in trouble for this, for writing this code and all these attacks. So he decided that for plausible deniability, I'm going to release that code, and I'm going to put it out there in hack forums. And he did. So he, he left this code, and as you can imagine, I mean, this was almost eight years ago. To this day, that code is still being utilized for botnets. Next. So I don't know if you guys, you guys ever heard of Mirai? Anybody heard of Mirai botnet? 
You have the route. Yeah, I mean, it has evolved. It has evolved now that it, uh, that code now attacks routers, right? So we did a search at, the, at his house. Click next. Where do you guys think I found the evidence of his attacks towards Rutgers? So we were there at first because of Mirai, but at the same time, we kind of realized, oh, he was a Rutgers student, and Rutgers was getting DDoS. So we were like, okay, it's probably the same, same individual. We went to his house. We had a court order signed by a judge to seize all his computers, cell phones, anything that it was electronics. Where do you guys think I found the evidence of his attacks towards Rutgers? Nope, not on desktop. Take a guess. I kind of mentioned it earlier. No, you said it. Cell phone, right? Click next. Now, let me tell you something, something funny about his cell phone. His cell phone, it was an iPhone. And he just got rid of it three weeks before we showed up in his house. iCloud backup, right? However, what's another option that you guys have to back up your iPhones? There's another option. You can back up to the iCloud, but what else? What, what's that called? The local backup, what's that called? iTunes. iTunes backup. That's right. So he had gotten rid of his phone, but before he got rid of the phone, he backed it up, he did an iTunes backup to his laptop. So even though his phone was gone, that backup was still there on his computer. So we were able to pull that backup out and see he had 100,000 Skype messages to show that with his co-conspirators, he was attacking Rutgers. Take a guess why. Why did he attack Rutgers? Bad grades. Revenge. Why? Thought we'd be funny. Actually, yeah, that's that's some of the motivation. As a freshman, right? When you're a freshman here, do you get first dib on classes? No, right? Who gets who gets first dib? Seniors, right? But as a freshman, he was pretty upset that he could not register for some classes that he wanted to register for. So guess what he did? He attacked Rutgers. Any other reason? You mentioned bad grades. Someone that is that smart, could he have bad grades? He's lazy, right? Yes. Very smart individual, but lazy. So during Christmas break, his father said, give me your username and password. I want to see your grades for school. And he was failing, out of all classes, he was failing like programming. I mean, he programmed like, like nothing, and he was failing that class. So he did not want his father to see the bad grade. So guess what he did? He took down the whole system. So his father could not see the bad grades, right? Click next. So here it is. After we found all the evidence, and we talked to him, he pled guilty of all his actions. And remember, like I said, all those DDoS attacks, it wasn't just one attack. It was about eight of them. Rutgers was spending millions and millions of dollars to fix, to fix their network. And as you can see, that's, uh, he has to pay 8.6 mil back to Rutgers. No, so he never got, funny thing, he never got jail time. Uh, and that wasn't because of FBI Newark. It was more because FBI Anchorage wanted him to help with the DDoS attacks. So he, had, he got five years probation, and he just finished his probation back in November. So again, very smart individual, but he just wrong choices, right? And the next case, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. 
I think this. All right, guys. So the next case is a little bit more recent, actually very recent. Um, we're going to be talking about ransomware. I don't know if you guys, how many of you guys have heard of Lockbit before? Okay, I got a few people in the back. Wow. All right. So Lockbit is um, a ransomware group. They operate as what's known as a, a ransomware um, as a service. So essentially you have the the top echelon people, like the actual like coders for the ransomware, and then they have people that work for them right so they have these uh, people that go out and infect take the networks infect them get the ransomware payments and then they pay a cut to the developers on the high on the high end so this is a relatively new structure and uh, this group is kind of pioneering it almost um, just as of 2024 we have 1600 uh, US victims and um, over 130 million was extorted so this actually is the lockbit like the leak site page here or actually, no, sorry, not the leak site page. This is what happens when you get infected with Lockbit. So the the Lockbit uh, 2.0, I think we're on 3.0 now, but 2.0 there, you see your files have been encrypted, you know, your typical ransomware, uh, you know, splash page here. Once you're infected, your network, look at the TXT file. Hey, I want my files back. All right, well, that's going to be 5 million. However, many, however much they set the, the ransom at, that's what you're going to have to pay. I skipped ahead here a little bit, but this is actually the leak site. So just a few examples of some uh, like companies and different organizations that have been infected uh, with the ransomware. They have a certain time in order to pay the ransom before their data is leaked on the leak site. So this data you know, can include whatever um, these ransomware actors are finding on the networks that they're infecting and uh, is uploaded to the leak site there. All right, so just in 2022, so a couple years ago, we arrested a uh, Lockbit affiliate named uh, Mikhail uh, Vasiliev. Um, sorry if I butchered that name there, Mr. Mikhail, but he was 33 from Ontario, Canada, right? And he is one of the actors that were doing the ransomware attacks. Uh, he was actually um, convicted and he's serving time in Canada. And then once that time is done, he will come to New Jersey and then Service time here. <laughs> so a year later, uh, we also had more indictments um, from Russian nationals. Uh, sorry about that. OK, yes, so from Russian national indictments regarding the Lockbit ransomware case. So as, as this case progresses, we start identifying more affiliates of the ransomware group and being able to gather evidence and indict these people. One of these people, um, Mikhail uh, Pavlovich Mad Madviv, uh, was one of the indictment uh, individuals. Uh, Mikhail is an interesting individual who I actually think did, uh, I think he was on a podcast, did some sort of interview regarding the indictment. Not a very nice guy, but um, Mikhail here, $10 million reward uh, for Mikhail's arrest. Um, he was one of the Lockwood affiliates similar to uh, Vasiliev from Canada. But he has not been arrested, he's just been indicted. Hey guys, did we get the sound to end up working or no? Hi. Uh, I, I guess I can, I'll just talk about the video real quick. So that was like a more or less like news, um, I guess an AI, it was an AI like news thing, right? Yeah, so this is regarding like uh, tech, tech talk uh, going on now. So that uh, news clip that we were showing you, that guy was actually like AI generated, whatever it was. And he's talking about the recent indictments here, the infrastructure seizure, uh, she's, she. Caesar, sorry, uh, from the Lockbit site. So as you can see, like most of those splash pages, as you guys might have known, like Alpha Bay and some of these older like um, like darknet marketplaces, you see like that splash page, like yo, like FBI, FBI has control of the site. Like, please check it, like whatever it was. So we ended up taking control of the infrastructure for Lockbit, the leak site there. Um, did you have that? Okay, there we go. So this is actually what the leak site looks like now. So remember the picture I showed you guys before where it was the various companies that were on the leak site and the timers counting down for how many days they got left to pay the ransom? Well, now the new leak site that we did uh, now shows different press releases and um, regarding uh, different decryption keys, recovery tools, the indictments that were published, and we also have a few cool things that were counted down to that I don't think the Lockbit administrators are going to like very much. But this is the new leak site here, um, obviously now controlled by us. <coughs> Alberto, you want to talk about this? 
So as Mike mentioned, uh, we were able to take over their uh, infrastructure. As you can, who uses Tor here? Why not? You can. That's okay. Right. So one of the advantage of Tor is what? Multiple layers of encryption. What else? What's another advantage of Tor? Anonymous browsing, right? So if you're hosting infrastructure in Tor, how easy is it to identify? How do you guys think? Is it, is it easy? It's very, very, very hard. But we were able to. We were able to identify Lockpick's infrastructure. And once we were able to identify it where it was, then we were able to seize it. So that's not something that it can happen, like in the movies, a couple of you know, keyboard keystrokes and it happens. No, it took months. And this investigation is going to years, right? Because the technology, it, it is so advanced, it's not easy, right? Especially in the Tor network, we have to deal with encryption and all this anonymous browsing. But we were able to do that. And we were able to do that um, two months ago, February. We were able to seize that. And one of the things is these guys are holding multiple companies victims. And the affiliates, which we were able to put out here, that's a list of affiliates. These are individuals that join the lockpit infrastructure so they can just get money. So you can imagine, not sure if NGIT has ever been a victim of ransomware, but you can imagine if that happened here, all of a sudden, the reasons why when you start paying you know, your classes and all of a sudden you start seeing the you know, why are things going up? It's because of this stuff right here. Because companies, if they're victims, they get attacked, it costs a lot of money just to be able to get back up and running. Next slide. So we were able to do that. But as you can see, even on other indictments, unfortunately, a lot of these individuals are sitting in countries that we have no extradition treaty. So Russia, for example, right? You guys saw the, the reward poster for Matt Vive. Matt Vive is in Russia. We indicted him. He knows he's indicted. He knows that we know who he is. And he's not hiding online. You can Google him and he will say, yes, I'm a Lockbit affiliate. I did attacks. And he actually, he's proud of it. He's proud to, to do that, right? Because unfortunately, we cannot go to Russia and uh, uh, make any arrests. Uh, but we do have rewards. Um, if these individuals ever leave Russia, we do have red notices on them. If they are able, if they ever travel to one of our US friendly country, hopefully we will you know, arrest them. And those red notices are there for life. So these individuals cannot leave Russia because of, of this kind of rewards and stuff that we have on them. And Mike mentioned, for example, we did arrest an individual who was a Canadian citizen, but he was also Canadian and Russian, and he was in Canada, and we were able to identify him, and we were able to get him arrested in Canada, but also we were able to also press charges here in New Jersey. So he finally played guilty in Canada. So Canada uh, government gave him four years of jail. But guess what? He still has to come here and pay. And then he will also go to court and go to trial. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's going to plead guilty. But he also has to do time here. Because these ransomware affiliates they not only attack United States, but they attack companies worldwide. So. One example, he attacked a lot of Canadian infrastructure, but also U.S. Now, I know we talked a lot today, but if you guys have any questions out of anything related to cases, the FBI, anything right now, you guys are more welcome to ask us. So the question is, if you go back 20 years when cell phones were just a flip phone 
and they have very limited data, what kind of information you could get, right? So uh, back then, you, you still had call, call logs, right? So you see address books, call logs. Back then, um, they still have text messages, right? So text messages. Uh, if you were going all old, old school, some text messages were being saved on SIM cards, for example. So you can actually export data out of SIM card and get some text messages there. Um, moving around, you know, between 2004 to 2010, all the data was on the phone, on the flip phones. They still, still, text messages was a lot. It was very important back then. There was no encryption. Uh, pretty much the general mode of communication back then was text messages. So we would see that a lot, especially, you know, drug dealers, everybody, you know, it was just text messages. Hey, meet me here. Or, you know, for example, like a murder, right? Hey, we're going to meet over here, and this is where the murder happened. So, uh, yeah, there was still a lot of information that we were able to retrieve from cell phones even back then. Yep. Any questions? So what's good of seizing an iPhone if it's still locked? Uh, we can still get in. So brute force. Has anybody heard of brute forcing? What's brute forcing? Yep, you're guessing every possible combination, right? So he mentioned Celebrite. If you guys go to the back, I have my Celebrite kit. You guys can see it. But yeah, there is ways to try to brute force into that, into that uh, lock device. So is it successful? Not all the time, but dependence on the individual, right? So how easy is to guess a four pin passcode, right? It's only 10,000 combinations, not that hard, right? But if you use a password, that's a lot harder, right? So you have a question? Yes, so the advances in technology, quantum computer, AI, uh, is, has been, at least for us, uh, we don't know what to do with it, <laughs> to be honest, right? We have found out that some ransomware actors are starting to use AI. A lot of what we call script kiddies before, like now, you really don't know, don't need to know how to code. You can just go to ChatGPT and say, Write me a Python code, a Python code to do this, and he will. AI will. So now it is becoming easier for bad guys to conduct these actions. And how can we stop it? Right? It's it's it's, it's becoming harder. Uh, it's a lot harder also when cloud infrastructure is not in the U.S. If that cloud infrastructure is sitting in Germany, for example. We identified it, but it's in Germany. Now we just we have to request the government of Germany, can you please get us this data? And they'll get it to us, maybe. If maybe. Sometimes they do, but then it's a year later, right? The attack happened today, but the evidence to get it, you don't get it until a year later. So what happens? It becomes stale, right? That's a that's very challenging. So uh and it's gonna, it's just gonna get, we just have to get, get very creative when it comes to those things, right? So they use cloud infrastructure, how can we get it just to get the evidence to us quicker? I think that's one of the biggest challenges. Any questions? Actually, I think that's a great question for you. Yeah, so I, I can give you guys a little bit of a look into like what it's like being a student and then going to the FBI because I, I was an intern previously, like I said, so I was here. Um, and some of the process, at least with the internship, like you have to go through a lot of the um, background checks that a normal employee would. Like you're going to have the same security clearance as like a normal full-time employee as an intern. 
So like the steps I would say like that comes first is obviously the application process, like sending a new resume and then doing the interview process, right? It's like any other job. And then once you get past those two phases of the interview, yes, we like you guys. All right, cool. Now we have to make sure that you guys are fully vetted. We can't just let anybody into the building, obviously. So from there, it kind of starts this whole domino effect of going through and filling out like a um, like an application for a top secret clearance. And then you go into different things like uh, polygraph examination as that's part of the background check. And then once you get through those two steps there, I think it's also a drug test too. Like, uh, I don't know exactly what the, they might've changed the drug policy recently. I think it might be one year now or something. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure on that. Probably check the website. Like, don't quote me. I'm not a, like a recruiting specialist or anything like that. But um, regardless, once you get through those three things, the application, well, interview, then application for the security clearance, polygraph, and the drug test takes maybe about, it took me, I think, four months, five months to hear back. So I applied in September. I did my interview stuff in like November, October, and I started my whole security clearance process from December to about mid-January, and then I didn't hear back until May. Once I heard back that I was good to go, I started on the job in June as an intern, and I was working part, well, during the summer you work full-time, and then during the school years you're gonna work part-time. They try to they make you more focused on school, which is obviously a good thing. They don't wanna overwork you. And then the transition from coming out of like college into a full-time role was pretty smooth because I was already on board, so I didn't have to go through that whole process again. But like I said, if you were to apply like after after college, so after you graduate, not as an intern, like as a full time position, or even if you work somewhere else and then you decide you want to come work here, it's a very similar process of application sent in, then you have your interview, you pass the interview, great, and then you go into stuff for background. And then once you're through all that stuff, then it's just kind of a waiting game as to when your start date will be, or if you're applying for a position that has to go through the academy. So like a position like an agent or an analyst, you guys are gonna have to go through the academy down at Quantico, which I don't exactly know what the time frame on the dates are for that. Again, that's more of like a HR recruiting thing, but once you get through all that stuff, you get through Quantico, boom, now you're on the job, good to go, now you're here. So, I mean, realistically, you're looking at, if you're an intern, maybe like eight months, if you're looking for a full-time position, could be closer to like a year, I would say, post like interview and then background stuff, good to go on the job is probably about a year. Sorry for the long-winded answer, though. <laughs> I gotta say, in my experience, it almost took a year as well. I was working in the private sector. Uh, I already had a full-time job. I went to, by the way, FB, fbijobs.gov. That's the website. That's where you see all the positions that are open. And I just went there. I applied. Didn't hear from them for like three months. Eventually, I got a call did a personal interview, and then actually after they told me I was selected, it had to go through the background check, and that's where it really takes a long time, especially depends on your age and where have you traveled. So if you traveled a lot overseas, then it, the background check will take a little bit longer. I was, in, I was in the military, so I did travel quite a lot as part of my military um, time, so uh, it did take almost a year for me to go through the background. Uh, background, like he says, the, also you have to do uh, a polygraph, so you sit with a lie detector. That's not always fun, but um, you have to go through that. And by the way, we have to do that every five years. So even though once you're already in, you still have to go through that test every five years. Any questions? Okay, I think uh, we're gonna hang out. We're gonna be in the back if you guys have any questions. If you just wanna just talk for a little bit, you're more than welcome to. And uh, thank you for your time. Thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate you coming out. Really appreciate it, guys. Thanks so much. All right, thank you again to our speakers from the FBI. Uh, to the stage now, I'm going to be inviting uh, Patrick Park, who is here with ISACA, to give our last and final presentation of the day in our speaker series. So please uh, welcome him to the stage.
Hello everyone, this is me again, the water bottle guy. Everyone got a water bottle? Not yet? Then you have to get it, right? Uh, otherwise, we're going to play a game called CTB, Capture Your Bottle, before the end of the event. So you have less than 12 hours to get your bottle, okay? So please get it. Uh, so what I want to give a little background of what I am so I grew up in, uh, in Brazil when I was four years old. And when I was 15, this was my first computer, CP300, right? Uh, it had a whopping uh, 16 kilobytes of memory, RAM, six, 15 kilobyte of ROM. And we convinced my brother and, my uh, my brother and myself, convinced my parents that we need to have that computer. And the sole purpose was to play that game called Robot Attack, right? So. We bought the computer, it came with a big manual, pages and pages of code, it was a basic code, and we started punching every single night for two days just for, to play that game. Uh, that's how I started learning coding in basic. So where I am now, uh, I am a director of information security in a law firm. I've been doing security for 20 years. Uh, I've been in different verticals all over, manufacturing, nonprofit, financial institutions, law firms, uh, healthcare, you name it. I've done it all. Uh, I do currently have a bunch of certifications, CCs, you see a lot of Cs there, uh, that you could talk about uh, with our table. After uh, this presentation, you could talk to us. I run uh, two, two teams. I run the GRC teams, which is risk compliance, governance risk com compliance. And I also run the secure operations. So I am 24, uh, 30, uh, 24 7, 365, the guy that needs to be awake when something happens. So how do you protect the organization? Simple. You put a door like that, you're done. End of presentation. Nah, not really, right? You know that's not true. So I have a question. How many of you think you can break to this door? Raise your hand. Okay, good. So now we're going to put our, um, our minds into a criminal mind, right? In order for you to, be, to understand how the attackers act, you have to think uh, like them, right? And that's what I think all the time. How about if I said there's $40 million now behind that door? You're a criminal. Can you break the door? How many can you break the door now? All right, more motivation, okay? So now, uh, let's say there is this door, and I'm going to give you some tools. Think about it. You could use lock pit. You could use a hammer, sledgehammer, or a steel cutter, or a truck. OK, how many of you use the lock pit? Raise your hand. OK, how about the hammer? Somebody use hammer? How about the steel cutter? Anyone? How about the truck? Oh, everybody. You guys are aggressive, right? You're just going to ram into the door. Great. So in cyber attack, when you think about that in criminal mind, there is always some motivation. One is uh, uh, financial motivation. There is also state nations that want to hack in to get some information. There is also organized crime. And they think nothing is impenetrable. They think they're going to break, break in and they're going to get in somehow. So look at this guy. He's only 15 years old. He was a hacker in 2017. And at 15 years, he had $1 million. He was able to make $1 million. And then look at all the fancy cars he had. Like he posted all this. Of course, the guy went to the jail. Now, how does organizations get breached nowadays? So there is a report from Verizon Data Breach Investigation uh, that you could download, you could put your name and download. And a lot of times it happens because of social engineering. 
So as you could see in 2017 to 2023, social engineering just skyrocketed super fast, and it's not stopping. When you look at the reason why organizations, companies get breached, there are three reasons, financial, espionage, and others, right? So number one issue why corporations get breached, because the attackers want money. Now, how do they get compromised? Three main vectors of attack. Uh, credentials, exposed, phishing, and exploits, vulnerabilities. Okay. If you look at the ransomware, everyone knows about ransomware? Have you heard about ransomware? Yeah? Okay. So if a per percentage of breaches of ransomware, as you can see from 2017 to 23, it's like skyrocket super fast. Now, how does the attack happen, right? If you look at this graph, this is exactly how corporations get breached. Two common attack vector is RDP and phishing. Have you heard about Shodan? Does anyone know Shodan? Yeah? Yeah, so you could find all kind of things open, right? RDP is very common. Second, phishing. They'll send a phishing email, people click, and guess what? Uh, send a payload. Now, interesting enough, the payload is not something fabricated. It's not like super complex. It's actually the attacker's users embedded tools in your machine. In corporations, the majority of the machines used, guess what? It's not Apple, it's Windows, right? Windows machine, so you have Windows machine? Majority of us, Windows machine. So they're using embedded tools like PowerShell, PWSH, MSPO compilers, CSC, .NET compilers, right? The attackers will use those embedded tools to get into the machine. So a lot of these tools, attacks happens, you know? Do you have antivirus? Everybody runs antivirus, right? Safe for you? Well, not, not against this type of attack, because guess what? There is no files. It's complete running memory. You can't prevent this thing. Okay? Once they get an attack, have you heard about Cobalt Strike? Anyone? Cobalt Strike? If you not, take a look, uh, research a little bit. Cobalt Strike is the number one tool the attackers use to do a C2 communications, command control communication. So Cobalt Strike, uh, you could make a beacon out of it. You could capture screen. Uh, you could capture keystrokes. You could transfer files. You can execute commands. Uh, you can spawn processes, and you can also do lateral movement just out of from somewhere, and you have no idea where it is from. So what are the attack techniques? Now, think it this way, right? You think corporations don't have defenses? Yeah, I have a lot of defenses. I have antivirus. I have a, a EDR. I have IP, IPS, intruder pre prevention sensors. I have a NDR, network detection response. Uh, I have a, a EDR antivirus. I also have a SIM to collect all the logs when I see bad activity. So how do they, buy, hit, what do they do? So the attack te technique is they're not noisy. You know, have you done the vulnerability scans? Yeah? Who did the scans? Nmap? Have you done Nmap? Yeah. Real attackers don't use that <laughs> because it's pretty noisy. We're going to detect them. So what they do, they use low-key attacks, very stealth and silent. They take months of years. They're not like 24 hours, you're going to try to break into system. It doesn't happen that way. So second, uh, they do situation awareness. So once in their machine, they explore everything the user has access, shared drives, applications, database, etc. They perform a direct lookup called LDAP queries, if you know Active Directory, if you're not, you're going to learn. And then it learns everything about the environment. The second stage, once they have that, they start copying data out. They start like moving documents out of that system. The third thing is they look for credentials in clear text. Believe it or not, people put a uh, text name password.txt in clear text. Very bad idea, but they do that. And they look for cookies, they look RDP sessions with credentials, and then also, you know, do you save your passwords on the browsers? Yeah, they go after that stuff too. 
And also, uh, more sophisticated attackers, after that, they're going to try to use dumb credentials. Mimikatz, does anyone know Mimikatz? Uh, probably. They're going to use that. And then once they have that, they're going to perform lateral movement. Now, once that machine, they're going to try to pivot to different machines. So they're going to use the credentials dumped from memory, the stuff that he captured from the text files. Uh, they're going to search slowly for vulnerability, right, on patch systems. And once they find those, they're going to try those vulnerabilities. And they're going to search for misconfigured conf uh, systems. It happens a lot. There's firewall misconfigurations, settings misconfigurations. And then once they, com they compromise more machines, they guarantee there is other method to gain access again, right? Let's say initial machine was attacked and the person shut down the machine. Guess what? He has access to another machine, okay? So this is what Cobalt Strike looks like, right? So having seen Cobalt Strike, it looks like that. Uh, they see a, an attack, a machine that has C2, command control back. And once they have access to one machine, they're going to pivot around different machines, OK? Uh, so this is more like a Microsoft published this. This is how uh, attacker happens with drive-by attacks, kind of like you click the link, they, you get something, you execute. And the same principle, they have this uh, attack vector, right? They have a command control. Now, ransomware operations. So. Ransomware operation is not just one individual. It's not just one group. It's several groups. As you can see this slide, there is actually, uh, you know, people that sell credentials, right? Their whole purpose is getting credentials, getting phishing attacks, you know, tricking people to put their username, password. Once they get that, millions and millions of credentials, they sell them. They give to another group, okay? Now, the second group called remote access operator, these are the ones that create the scripts, the ransomware, the payload, which then they're going to give to the ransomware uh, affiliate. And those guys are going to use the credentials. They're going to get to use the tools to actually perform the attack. Once they get the money, guess what? They split the earnings between all these different operators. Uh, there are some of them. Maybe you heard Black Hat, Hive, Conti, Buke. Those are all like hacking groups out there, and they make tons of money. Okay, so myth and reality. You know, a lot of people say attacks are sophisticated, right? Is it true? You're going to think about that. Uh, they say make passwords very long because prevent attacks. Is it true? We're going to look at that. Training, right? People say you need to train your people every year to reduce attack vector. Is it true? We're going to see that. Uh, and a lot of times, for many years, it says two-factor everything. You're going to be secure. Well, is it true? We're going to see that. Uh, let's look at the attacks are sophisticated. This is funny. Uh, it says one of the articles says, Microsoft top execs email breach in sophisticated Russia-linked APT attack. So if you read the article, you know what it says? Use the password spray attack to compromise a legacy non-production test tenant account and gain a foothold. Yeah, really sophisticated, right? Right, Jack the Reaper, Hydra, Metasploit, brute force attempts on the passwords. There's nothing sophisticated about that. So long password presents attacks, right? So initially, you know, passwords were very simple, one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, everyone could guess it. And then over a year, they make it more complex, right? Now you require upcase, lowercase, special characters, and all that, right? And then it says, you know what, uh, put special characters too. And now rotate every 90 days, right? Uh, you change your password. How many enjoy changing your password every 90 days, right? No, nobody enjoys that. So, and then uh, make it longer, right? Uh, make it uh, hard to crack. The, anybody likes Taylor Swift? What? <laughs> yeah? Look, Taylor Swift 2024 exclamation. That's super long. It's 16 characters long. But anyone can guess that thing. It's so easy, right? So no point of doing that. And then it says, you know what? Uh, it's not like, don't allow people to use these words anymore. You know, uh, ban this type of password, compromise password. But if you keep doing that, we're going to run out of passwords, right? Every word or sentence, we're going to like 
No more passwords. What are we going to do? So imagine if your uh, password is eight character long with complexity, it only takes five minutes to crack your password. That's how fast it is, right? And in making longer, it takes some of them takes like five billions a billion years to crack it, but still it doesn't matter. Okay, how about training, right? Secure awareness training everybody, okay? It's gonna make it better. Do you see that screen? Yeah? That looks like Microsoft. Do you know if it's real Microsoft? Oh uh, yeah, phishing page? How do you know? You just assume. You click on the link. You see that? Is it real Microsoft? Phishing? Microsoft? Oh, yeah. But see, for a regular person, that looks like Microsoft. Like, really? It doesn't work. So as we, uh, as organization, we send this attack simulation training phishing uh, email simulations every week. Guess what? And this is across the industry. It's not just us. Five to seven percent of people provided their credentials. Five to seven. Now our organization has only two thousand years, uh, two thousand users. So a hundred people provided their credentials. So you have a hundred ways to get into our company. Now imagine an organization with twenty thousand users. You have 1,000 ways to get into that organization. Huge problem. So just training, it doesn't help. How about two-factor authentication? Everyone use two-factor authentication? Yeah? Yeah, guess what? So people say, oh, I don't like to put those numbers. So annoying. So they made it easier. Push, right? MFA fatigue, push notification. Do you know how many, how many you actually saw before pushing? Right? Uh, I have cases that a lady says, call us like frantic and says, oh my God, Patrick, I think uh, you need to change my password. I said, why? Oh, I think I clicked something bad. You think? <laughs> you just, you didn't see before clicking? Wow. You just clicked it, right? You didn't think. We click too fast. People click too fast. Okay? And like I said, most people, most people don't even check. They just see this pop up and go for it. Okay, click, click, right? <laughs> we are societal, click, click, click. We like to click and go. Okay, so what's uh, today's reality? So Robert Merler, former director of FBI, there's FBI folks in this room. This is what he said in 2012. He said there are only two types of company, those that have been hacked and those that will be hacked. There's no other ones. Sorry. Uh, sorry to put the uh, cold down your water. You could try to be the best defenders. You're learning all the hacking. There's only two type of organizations. And this is true because if you see how cyber attacks keep on growing, when, 20, when they talk about in 2012, you know, it was kind of low. Now it keeps spik spiking up. And it doesn't slow down. The problem is so big that it's going to cost $10.5 trillion in losses by 2025. We're not talking about millions, billions. We're talking about trillions. Okay. It's a huge number. You know, Clorox, have you heard about Clorox breach? Clorox got breached. Yep, they got hacked. So their whole manufacturing operations just completely halted. They tried to recover, fix all this problem. Look how much it cost them. $356 million to fix the problem. Okay. So they spend all this money. You know who's going to pay for it? Yeah, your mom. <laughs> Next time she goes by Clorox, price went up, jacked up. Okay. How about healthcare group? Any of you, your parents, grandpa, couldn't get the prescription, drugs, had to pay cash? Yeah, they got breached. Yeah, black cat. Uh, they got a ransomware. They ended up paying $22 million. Okay. And for weeks, people couldn't buy prescription. They have to pay on credit card, whatever, pay cash. It big mess. So what's the future threat? AI. AI is a big threat. Uh, this case, a financial worker paid $25 million. Somebody made a deep fake of someone very important. 
So it's wired $25 million, right? It looks real, looks that person, the voice is the same, $25 million gone. Uh, how do we pr protect AI like uh, the person from FBI said? We don't know. We really don't know how to protect from AI. Uh, governance, audit, compliance, security, we don't know. That's up to this generation to figure out. Like We're trying to figure out how we protect ourselves against this type of stuff. So you ask, uh, why does it keep on happening? Why this company gets breached? Why they don't fix this? And there is a Patrick Park in every single organization. Why we keep on getting hacked? Well, one of the problem is we as security professionals, we are not part of the business decision process. We are after the fact. And if you're going to secure a few, you're going to feel like you're the guy left out. This has to change. Second, small budget for security. Security was always after the thought, you know, after the fact. When, oh my God, it got breached, then they pump all the money, right? Before, it's not. You're just expenditure. They don't, you don't get profit putting security. And resistance to change. People hate to change. Uh, People don't want to change anything. They want to keep on doing the same way they do it. You put two-factor authentication. They don't want it. It's all resistance. And the other thing is predictable human behavior, right? The attackers know how we behave as human. We, they know we want easy way, click, 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 right? We, we don't read. We just put our credentials. We didn't read that it was really Microsoft or not Microsoft. We just, boom, we just put our things so they know about that. Uh, I said security is not priori priority. I said security is viewed as a hindering business, right? They don't care about security until something bad happens. So how is it going to change, right? We need you. We need everyone in this room, new generation of professionals, secure professionals. So cyber attack is not just my problem. It's not the defender's problem. It's not a company problem. It's actually a problem for entire society. Right, so think about it. Think it this way. How many of you know someone lost money, their bank account got cleared out, you know, your grandpa got scammed, you know, you lost money, they got into your credit card. It's a society problem. It's not just in one individual problem. It needs to be fi fixed. So new we need a new generation of defenders, right? The old way, old way of doing things, it just doesn't work. If it worked, we wouldn't be ta I wouldn't be talking about this today. We need to change that. And also we need uh, new secure experts in the field of AI. We don't know how to fix that problem yet. Okay, so we need smart people like you, young people, to come up with a solution for us. And we need new generation of software de developers that has solid understanding of security and applying into their work, uh, work product, right? A lot of things developers are so in a rush in developing something cool, and they don't care about security. And then we deal with the problems right? after the fact, patching, whatever, vulnerabilities. Oh, you didn't think about that, right? And also, we need new generations of engineers with solid understanding security and also applying in their work product, right? We need better engineers. Security might focus engineer, not just creating products. And also, we need new leaders to make changes, right? I'm getting old. Next year, when I come back, I'll be older. But we need a new generation of leaders, right? That's you, you over here, OK? So that was my presentation. Any questions, comments? All good? No? All right, good. So thank you for listening to me, and uh, have fun. All right, thank you very much, guys, for listening to our speaker series. I thought they were all very informative, very good supplements to the event you guys are at today. Um, uh, I hope everything is going well. Uh, like we've said, if you have any questions, feel free to submit a ticket in the SOS help channels and all that. Um, but besides that, yeah, enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Uh, Dinner is going to be out uh, in a few hours for those of you sticking around. And just remember that the building closes, the doors lock on the building at 10. So just be aware of that whether you're staying or going tonight. All right, enjoy, have a good one.